Welcome back, everybody. Uh, today we've got something really fun to do. We're going to talk about terrestrial planets. Um, I'm, of course, Stephanie Welch. This is Earth and Space Science 102. And after we talk about terrestrial planets today, we'll go on to talk about the Jovian planets and then a whole lecture on miscellaneous objects in the solar system. So these last three lectures are going to be wrapping up the unit on the solar system. Then we'll go on to talk about uh, astronomy outside of our own solar system. So today we're going to talk about terrestrial planets, so I thought we'd start off with a little bit of a guessing game with uh, the actual four terrestrial planets. From this perspective, they probably don't look that entirely uh, uh, similar to each other. We've been treating these objects as being very, very similar to each other in sort of the broader context of a step back and looking at our solar system. But when you actually look at them up close on this scale, they are, are less similar than what we been talking about so far. So that's the main objective today is to look at the differences between all the terrestrial planets. Now if you were to compare these objects in scale to some of the other groups of objects in the solar system, you would see how similar they truly are. If you compared any of these four objects to Jupiter, for instance, Jupiter would uh, not really even be visible on the same scale as, as, as these objects. You'd have to uh, uh, broaden out your scale um, pretty significantly. And the same would be true for the sun. If we were talking about the really tiny objects in the solar system, then again, these would be uh, massive in comparison. So the terrestrial planets are, of course, Earth, Mars, Venus, and Mercury. And that's not the order that we have them presented today. Um, Earth is pretty easy to pick out on this picture, obviously, the one with the oceans and the continents and an active weather cycle, the uh, upper left-hand picture on, this, uh, um, on this, this one slide. The rest of them, it takes a little bit of time to actually be able to tease out, but I'll go ahead and label these uh, for you. Um, so in this, uh, in this next slide, you can see Earth, Mercury, the one next to it, the very, very small, very cratered planet. The lower left is Venus, the one that, unless you're looking at it under a very different wavelength of light, all you can really detect are the clouds, but you can already see it's roughly the same size as Earth. And then finally Mars at about half the size of Earth. Now, looking at the surface of these planets actually gives us a lot of information, even about the interior of the planets. So that's our, our main objective today, is to use uh, surface and all of the surface exploration tools at our disposal, all these great images that have come from various NASA um, probe missions and rover missions, to give us a little bit of an understanding of what's going on on the planet's interior. <clears throat> Before we get to looking at all of these planets individually, I wanted to explain why we can uh, use surface exploration as a tool for understanding the planet's interior. The state of the surface is going to be very indicative of the amount of heat, uh, residual heat left from the planet's accretionary process. So the amount of surface activity is going to be indicative of, um, we're going to find out a little bit later, the size and mass of the planet. Now, the first thing that's very, very obvious on some but not all of the terrestrial planet is impact cratering. And we'll even throw the moon in as sort of a fifth terrestrial planet. We think it sort of was at some point in the early days of the solar system. It was a separate planet whose impact with Earth produced the object that we're currently calling our moon. It's the only large moon of all the terrestrial planets. So here's some side-by-side -side pictures of uh, impact craters on Earth versus an impact crater on the Moon. And they're really not all that uh, dissimilar from each other. Impacts are a really, really common process, uh, it, especially in the early days of the solar system when all of the planets were really sort of still being formed by this impact uh, process. So you have to think about the interior of the solar system as at least originally being host to a swarm of teeny tiny objects whose collisions built the planets. The terrestrial planets only had that rock and metal to build the planets out of. So again, they were relatively small compared to the Jovian planets that we'll discuss in the next lecture. 
So you can already see similar processes on Earth versus the Moon. The difference here is that an impact on Earth is going to be very sort of quickly destroyed through erosional processes and through the plate tectonic process, whereas an impact crater on the Moon could remain relatively untouched. It could be re uh, relatively unchanged for possibly billions of years, because there are just no processes on the Moon that could destroy surface features like this. So what we can take away from this is that if you have an object, a planet, with a lot of impact cratering on the surface, it probably hasn't changed much over time. It may have remained completely unchanged for billions of years. Some of the terrestrial planets, as we'll find, are very, very heavily cratered, and therefore we can conclude that they are not being subjected to an active recycling process. There's no plate tectonic process or erosion that are changing those surfaces surface, the surface of that planet. And if those processes are not in action, that means that the interior of the planet is most likely cold. As we learn in 101, in Earth Science 101, heat drives geological activity. Heat drives the plate tectonic process. Heat drives um, atmospheric circulation and the erosional processes. And heat also drives uh, the magnetic field of a planet. And all of these things are crucial to that sort of surface recycling process. So any heat, either internal heat, um, let's say convection of the mantle and convection of the outer core, or external heat, convection of the, uh, the, the inner atmosphere of a planet, all of these things are very important to these uh, surface recycling processes. Now, another thing that we conclude, conclude about the interior of all of these terrestrial planets is that they've been differentiated by density. And we're assuming that based on the fact that Earth's interior is differentiated by density. This sounds a lot more complicated than it really is. Basically, when a planet like Earth or Mercury or Mars originally formed, it was this uniform, homogeneous mix of rock and metal and all of this stuff with different densities. As those collisions occur and actually build the planet, they generate a tremendous amount of heat, melting all of these objects and allowing for differentiation by density. Basically, just that means that the more dense materials are pulled down to the very center of mass of the planet, the very core of the planet, all the more lightweight materials float up to the surface. And you can see this on the surface of the Earth happening in the same way, differentiation by gravity. If you mix oil and water, of course the oil will float up to the surface, the water will sink. And it's for the same reason that the Earth's interior is differentiated by density. It's just what gravity does. Now, as gravity is pulling the Earth and, and the other terrestrial planets, we can conclude into this configuration, which you ultimately wind up with is the structure of both the Earth's interior and we think the structure of the other terrestrial planets' interiors. We think that just like Earth, the other terrestrial planets have an outer crust, the only part that we can actually see that makes up basically the surface of that planet, and it's brittle because it's exposed to the atmosphere and exposed to potentially outer space. So it's cooled off for a very, very long time. Earth's surface is cool. Um, the surface of all of the ter other terrestrial planets are, are cool. But the interior of that planet might not necessarily be uh, completely cooled off. Um, the lower part of the crust, the mantle, and especially the core still carry with them a lot of that residual heat, mainly from the accretion of the planet to begin with. So not only is Earth's interior differentiated into crust, mantle, core, again, the other terrestrial planets we think are differentiated the same way and have that sort of crust, mantle, core. And if so, it's possible for those planets to have an active plate tectonic cycle, either at some point in the past or have an active plate tectonic cycle now in the present day. So what we know about the surface of the Earth is that it does have an active plate tectonic cycle, and that's a really important part of why we don't see the impact cratering from billions of years ago. The evidence, essentially, the, the impact craters themselves have been recycled away in this big game of plate tectonics.
The Earth's surface is uh, theoretically made up of these puzzle pieces, these plates in plate tectonics that are constantly in motion, and these plates move towards and away from each other. And as these plates move towards each other, they can be destroyed. And the surface geology of Earth is really just a um, an expression of this plate tectonic cycle. The fact that we have ocean basins and continents and mountains, the fact that we have earthquakes and volcanic activity, it's all just a result of that plate tectonic cycle. So not only is the surface of the Earth constantly being recycled through plate tectonics, we have all of this very, very stark evidence of that plate tectonic cycle exposed on the surface. Probably one of the sharpest features that you can pick out on Earth and with some of the other terrestrial planets is evidence of volcanic activity. Volcanic activity leaves very, very obvious structures on a planet. You can see uh, from well out into space some of the larger uh, volcanic islands and volcanic features on, on Earth, whether they're active or not. They build gigantic mountains. So particularly volcanic activity and really all of this evidence from plate tectonics like uh, surface fracturing and subduction zones, all that kind of stuff, is going to be something that you can't really hide on a planet's surface. And that is going to be indicative of what's going on in the planet's interior, hopefully presently or at least at some point in the past. Now, the last thing that we're going to be looking for when we compare all of these terrestrial planets is evidence of a magnetic field, like the Earth's magnetic field. The Earth has this magnetic field that currently runs out of the North magnetic field pole into the south magnetic pole, and it's generated in the outer core, where the metal that makes up the core is actually in a liquid state. Because it's very, very hot, this iron and nickel can actually exist as a liquid metal, and it can convect, it can move around, and the motion of that metal generates the magnetic field. If the core were ever to freeze out, if it were ever to cool down to the point where it would solidify, then the field would shut down. And the field's very important because it essentially protects our atmosphere. The solar wind is constantly being emitted from the sun and slung out in all directions. It's a stream of charged particles. And those particles, if uh, allowed to penetrate a planet's atmosphere, would slowly strip away that planet's atmosphere. Our planet being protected by the magnetic field causes those charged particles to be deflected towards the poles. And all they do is produce a really cool light show, the northern and southern lights, instead of being allowed to strip away our atmosphere. So part of uh, the potential for a planet to actually retain an atmosphere is built in with the potential for that planet to retain that magnetic field process. So it's all related to the interior of the planet still being hot. So these are some of the things that we're going to be looking for on Mars, on Venus, on Mercury, on the other terrestrial planets that we don't know as well as Earth. We'll be looking for evidence of a magnetic field, evidence that that planet is able to retain an atmosphere as thick as ours for long periods of time. We're going to be looking for evidence of surface geology. And in lieu of all of the rest of that stuff, we'll be looking for lots and lots and lots of impact craters, because that tells you that a planet really hasn't changed changed over time and is uh, essentially sort of cold and dead in space. <clears throat> The, um, the last thing that we could be looking for is any uh, evidence of erosion. And erosion carries with it this need for a planet to have an atmosphere and potentially even an active water cycle or something at least similar to a water cycle. Essentially, on Earth, because we have a thick atmosphere and because we have a range of temperatures that allow for water to exist as a solid, a liquid, as, and as a gas, uh, then we have an erosional cycle. We have rain that falls down onto the surface of the planet and erodes rocks and uh, smooths down features on the surface, creates river valleys and creates big delta plains and all of these things that are very obvious uh, from looking at Earth as, as something outside. Um, 
if you don't have an active erosional cycle, your planet would look very different as a result. Uh, something like impact craters, for instance, would remain completely unchanged over time because there's no wind, there's no water, there's no glaciers, there's nothing moving across the surface of those, the planet to change those features over time. All right, so now let's go back to the picture again, the picture of all four of the terrestrial planets. And the last one that we're going to get to is Earth. If we're looking for evidence of geological activity, of, of uh, heat inside the planet, we already know that Earth has that, then a good hypothesis to, to maybe have at this point would be that Earth has maintained all this geological activity simply because it's huge. It's the largest of all of the terrestrial planets. So if we're looking for that same sort of activity, we're probably more likely to find it on Venus and maybe Mars than on Mercury. So let's start with Mercury and see how different Mercury is from Earth. Now, if we were looking at the planets in order of increasing distance away from the sun, Mercury would be first. Mercury is the first rock from the sun, and we're the third rock from the sun. Mercury is this extremely small terrestrial planet. In fact, that makes it the smallest out of all of the objects that we currently consider to be planets. It zips around the sun really, really fast. But if you actually look at the object itself, it's unfortunately a pretty boring object. It's a really, really small planet that we think has not changed significantly for three or four billion years. This is an object that doesn't have an atmosphere, both because it lacks a magnetic field and because it was never massive enough to actually attract an atmosphere or retain an atmosphere to begin with. So there is no atmosphere on the planet. There's no erosion. There's no water cycle. There are no clouds. Uh, it's very similar to the moon in that respect. It's made up of metal and rock, just as all the terrestrial planets are made up of metal and rock, and it does most likely have a crust, a mantle, and a core. But the big difference on Mercury is that while the core is probably roughly the same size as Venus and Earth and Mars, the mantle is much, much smaller. One hypothesis for the mantle's small size on Mercury is that it had been uh, exposed to some huge, huge impact a long, long time ago, uh, maybe a similar impact to the one that produced our moon. But in the case of Mercury, that that impact only served to blast the mantle off the planet, to basically sort of knock material that had accreted onto the planet off. And so what you're left with is very, very, very thin mantle and a huge iron core. This essentially doesn't allow for the core to really be insulated, and that might be part of the reason why it cooled off so, so early. So it's a desolate, very, very cold object, which you wouldn't really expect being parked right next to the sun, but it gets far colder on Mercury than it ever gets on Earth or Venus or even potentially Mars because there's no atmosphere to insulate the surface of the planet. So on the surface, while it's capable of reaching a daytime temperature of 425 degrees Celsius, so that's getting upwards of 800 degrees Fahrenheit to give you an idea of the kind of temperature temperature that melts rock. The nighttime temperature drops all the way down to negative 170 degrees Celsius, or you know, uh, uh, around about uh, negative 350 degrees Fahrenheit. So ridiculously cold temperatures during the nighttime cycle. Not having an atmosphere allows for that increase in temperature that the planet experiences during the day to just completely disappear at night. So it's very, very cratered from its original formational processes and from the sort of early heavy bombardment period in the solar system. It's cold at night, really hot during the day, completely lacking an atmosphere, and basically lacking any sort of evidence of geological activity. So we'll call this planet geologically dead and move on. Well, I've got many, many slides for some of the other planets that we're going to talk about. Mercury is one that we can sum up pretty succinctly. So now we're going to move on to Mars. While I could really come up with no more than maybe five minutes of conversation with somebody regarding Mercury, I, I could probably come up with a half an hour of conversation with someone 
when we're dealing with Mars, because Mars is a lot bigger than Mercury, a lot more massive, uh, and parked in a really interesting place. It's the fourth terrestrial planet in our solar system. So in order, we're looking at Mercury, Venus, Earth, and then Mars as being the most exterior of all of the terrestrial planets. When you then go back and compare it to Earth, you still see that it's nowhere near as close in size and mass as Earth, but it's large enough to be a lot more interesting to us than Mercury is. It's red, visible from really great distances, and it probably has conjured up uh, some of Mars's uh, kind of mythology, where this is thought to be, you know, the planet that's most associated with uh, with um, war and masculine personality. Men are from Mars, all that kind of stuff. All it really means is that the thin little bit of atmosphere that it does have is rich in CO2, and that's what makes the planet appear red from a great distance. So the little thin atmosphere that it does have is carbon dioxide rich. It does have moons, but these wouldn't be moons that would be visible from the surface of the planet at all. It wouldn't be like if you were looked up into our sky and you saw instead of one moon, two moons in the sky. Our moon is gigantic. It's a quarter of the size of our planet. Whereas in the case of Mars, these two moons, uh, Phobos and Deimos, are most likely captured asteroids. You know, so wouldn't even be visible from the surface of the planet. You can barely distinguish them from the asteroid belt, but it's the only other terrestrial planet in our solar system that has moons. There's lots and lots of cool surface to ge geology to look at. So from the perspective of being a geologist, Mars is the most interesting of any of the other terrestrial planets. Evidence of volcanoes that are two to three times as big as any volcano on the surface of the Earth. Um, places where water probably existed in the past. Uh, old ocean basins, ice caps. Uh, water certainly still present in the subsurface on that planet and in the form of ice, but not really present on the surface. And so where you find water on a planet, everybody always wants to jump to this possibility of life, because water being this wonderful solvent is incredibly important, at least for life on Earth. And if we're taking the kind of conditions we have on Earth and trying to apply them to other planets to find the potential for life, at least in our solar system, water is going to be pretty important, um, at least if we're trying to find anything that resembles life on Earth at all. Now. I have to warn you to begin with, any kind of exploration of Mars and any looking for the potential for life in the past or life in the present is not going to yield some large creature, some sort of Marvin the Martian kind of creature. Any kind of life that we would ever expect, even in the past, to exist on Mars would most likely be microbial, would be extremely tiny. So it's going to be life that's going to be very difficult to track down, but I certainly haven't given up on the idea that we might even find life still clinging to an existence on Mars. That uh, maybe at some point in the next few years, we might be getting an announcement that NASA's found some evidence for, for um, active life even now on the planet. So before I get back to life, the exploration for life is intimately tied up with the exploration of, of water on planet Mars, I want to take a minute to compare Mars to Earth. Now, Mars is probably one of the most similar of the terrestrial planets to Earth, but that doesn't extend to the size and mass of the planet. That's probably the most stark difference between Mars and Earth. Mars is about half the size of our planet. It's about the size of the object that probably impacted our planet to produce our moon. So but being about half the size is only half the story. Mars is also 10% of the Earth's mass, one-tenth of the Earth's mass. So not only is it about half the size of our planet, but some of its interior is probably structured in a very different way than our planet's interior. Uh, the very densest part of the planet, the core, is probably a lot smaller, um, and most of the interior is probably made up of slightly more lightweight materials than our planet is. So that gives you an idea of how you can have such a difference between the size and mass of the planet. 
Mars has an extremely thin, almost non-existent atmosphere when you compare it to Earth's. Earth has an atmosphere rich in nitrogen, oxygen, just tiny little bits of carbon dioxide. And the tiny bits of carbon dioxide on our planet, making up less than 1% of our entire planet's atmosphere, is probably similar to the total atmosphere composed of carbon dioxide on a planet like Mars. So even though carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas, it's not thick enough on Mars to actually retain a tremendous amount of heat and insulate the planet to any sort of great degree. Certainly not enough to keep it warm enough for humans to exist comfortably on the planet, even if we did have oxygen to breathe, to breathe there. Probably one of the coolest things is that while there is no surface water that is um, uh, active throughout the entire year and present throughout the entire year. There are no oceans and no uh, um, uh, nothing but maybe ephemeral rivers on the surface of Mars. We think there used to be because there's substantial erosional evidence, substantial evidence of flowing liquid water in the past on Mars. So I wanted to show you some pictures of this. And as just a, you know, a quick little primer, we've probably done more surface surface exploration of Mars than perhaps any of the other terrestrial planets in our solar system, both because Mars is relatively close to us and because it's a lot easier to photograph than Venus. Venus is a terrible place to go visit for reasons that we'll talk about later. Uh, Venus has proved um, many, many times more difficult to uh, to look at than, than Mars. Um, so some of these pictures come to us from probes uh, from um, um, unmanned uh, sp space uh, missions that have essentially just uh, led to an object being in orbit around Mars and taking measurements of its magnetic field and taking pictures of the surface and so on. And some of them have actually yielded rover missions. Um, so missions that have actually landed on the surface of the planet and roam around now taking some pictures up a little bit closer. So this is a picture from one of these um, unmanned probe missions where you can actively see river valleys on the surface of Mars. And this is really cool because this is something we would never ever expect to find on, let's say, Mercury. This is absolute evidence that temperatures were once much warmer on the surface. The atmosphere must have been a lot thicker at some point in the past. And water was uh, capable in this range of temperatures uh, of being in all three forms, as a solid, a liquid, and as a gas. So there was an active water cycle on the planet. Rivers on Earth today carve these exact same kind of features, dendritic or tree-shaped uh, river basins that flow into big bodies of water like oceans. Now, in this picture, you see that this is all sort of peppered with big impact craters. So maybe at the same time that these rivers were forming, maybe a little bit earlier, the planet was also uh, very heavily impacted um, by, by cratering. Uh, probably one of the coolest features on Mars is the largest moon of any of the terrestrial planets. And this includes Earth. So Mars, while we don't think it actually has an active plate tectonic cycle, has a feature that's remnant from a time when it must have had a really very, very active geological uh, cycle and plate tectonic cycle. There must have been heat in the planet's interior, at least at some point. This enormous volcano is called Olympus Mons. It is 15 miles above sea level, so that makes it almost three times higher than Mount Everest if you're measuring from above sea level. Um, and uh, probably at least three times as large as the biggest volcano on Earth, uh, Mauna Kea. So it's capable of being this gigantic, even though it's not an active volcano. Uh, you know, so the Mars rover Curiosity could roam if it really wanted to, if they wanted to send it up Olympus Mons. It could roam all over the place on Olympus Mons, and we're not expecting it to actually erupt anytime soon. So speaking of uh, the Mars missions, the most recent of the rover missions were, of course, um, Spirit and Opportunity in the early part of the 2000s, and most uh, currently, a rover called Curiosity. 
which in, a, in addition to being able to take great pictures, even some selfies, as we'll see in just a minute, um, Curiosity also has a complete organic chemistry lab on board. And so what it's looking for is the possibility that life ever arose in the past on Mars by looking for um, any sort of organic compounds that might still be uh, remaining on the planet's surface, uh, to try to get an understanding of the climate of Mars, the geology of Mars, the part that's really interesting for me, and to begin to sort of carve the way for human exploration of Mars in the next 10 or 20 years. So while we'll never be able to exist on Mars comfortably, I think that in the very, very short future, we'll be able to actually send humans to Mars. We'll be able to send people to Mars. And hopefully beyond the um, scientific information that that's going to give us, I think that's going to sort of uh, reignite space exploration, really excite people about astronomy and about, um, uh, about uh, the NASA missions. So I wanted to send, just to show you a couple of quick pictures from Mars here. Uh, this is a self-portrait or a selfie that a Curiosity took, and it's a composite picture, which is why you don't actually see the arm that's reached out that's taking this picture. Um, it's a self-portrait at a, a point on um, Mars called uh, Murray Buttes. Um, so you can already see the just desolation of the land surface. It obviously looks very, very different than the surface of the Earth. We're, we're not, we don't have any, you know, active plant species, obviously. Uh, no sort of active erosional cycle, no active plate tectonics. So we think that conditions probably haven't changed there. But everything that Curiosity is sending back and some of these previous rover missions have sent back have alluded to the possibility of some sort of active water cycle and some sort of surface geology cycle and internal geology cycle, at least in the past. Uh, one of the greatest pictures that shows this is one of the Curiosity pictures at a place called Mount Sharp. You can see active layering of sedimentary rocks on the surface. On Earth, what that means is that this entire area used to be underwater. When you have an area underwater, you have the slow settling down of sediment to create beds or layers of sedimentary rock. Um, it's the part of the science of stratigraphy, um, understanding strata on Earth. So that's the same sort of strata that we see uh, residually on Mars, uh, lingering back from a time when Mars actually had a substantial amount of liquid water. In addition to this, some of the earlier uh, Mars missions were actually able to uh, find these little hematite nodules. They were called hematite blueberries by NASA for a little while that had weathered out of the rock. And what's really special about this particular mineral find is that it almost had to have formed underwater. These little hematite uh, bubbles, basically, these little blueberry-sized nodules. So all of this definitely points to the possibility of water on the past, and it's not even so much of a possibility at this point as almost a, a definite, but whether that water ever harbored any sort of primitive life is still an unknown for us, and something that I hope that is going to become more clear in the next few years. Now, one of the biggest things that we now understand about the climate on Mars uh, is that probably conditions have changed to make it much, much colder over time. And there's a very, very good reason for this. We think for possibly even as long ago as two or three billion years ago, the interior of Mars began to cool off. The first thing that would have happened would have been that the magnetic field would not have been capable of continuing to be produced. Some of those unmanned probe missions that I was talking about that would take um, magnetic field information from the surface of the planet allows us to understand that some parts of the surface of Mars are actually magnetized, um, where the rocks are magnetized to a line in a particular direction. And then some of the younger parts of the surface of the planet are not magnetized. What that tells us is that Mars probably had a magnetic field like Earth at some point in the past, maybe for the first billion years or so of its history, but it now no longer has a magnetic field. And the magnetic field is what protects the atmosphere. 
So as the magnetic field declined because the core froze out on this planet, the first thing to go would have been some of the planet's atmosphere to be slowly stripped away over time. And we see that process continuing today where little by little the tiny bits of carbon dioxide left in the planet's atmosphere are continuing to be stripped away. And what that would have done would have been to make temperatures too cold on the surface for that water to exist on the surface anymore. The water that then got into the planet's atmosphere through evaporation, that too would have been stripped away. And the little bit of water that still remains is locked up in the polar ice caps and locked up underground. And the only surface water that Mars sees at this point is from some melting of those ice caps. We see some small amount of surface water running off of the melting of those ice caps during the summer months uh, from one hemisphere to the next. So it's a pretty sad story when you kind of stop and think about it on Mars. Mars might have been a planet that was possibly the most similar to Earth in the past, but both because it's a smaller and less massive planet than our own, the core probably stopped being capable of producing a magnetic field. The mantle cooled off to the point where there's not as much ongoing plate tectonics activity. And the planet, even though it might have had this really rich history and this potential for life, is now uh, uh, no longer really has that potential. But we've managed to find life on Earth in some really strange environments beneath miles of snow beneath a tremendous amounts of ice in ridiculously hot places and ridiculously saline environments. And so I, I hold out hope that there might be some lingering evidence of life on Mars, as strange as it might be given the um, extremeness of the surface conditions on that planet. So what I want to do next is move on to the next planet up. And I'm doing this in a very, very um, important order. We're going from the smallest and least massive planet, that was Mercury, to Mars. And now next up is Venus. And if you look at it from a great distance and you compare it to Earth, it would be really easy to fall into the trap that Venus is almost like Earth's twin. But the conditions on the surface are very, very unlike that of Earth. Uh, Venus, in short, would be a really, really terrible place to go visit directly. Um, even uh, probe missions, even unmanned um, missions have not spent more than maybe 10 minutes on the planet's surface before being completely destroyed by a really, really terrible, terrible atmospheric conditions on this planet that we'll get to in just a minute. Um, what I wanted to, to mention first is that, uh, like Mars, Venus is very, very easily visible on Earth, and probably also like Mars, you've often mistaken it for a star. If you're looking up at night and you see an extremely bright star in the sky, and it doesn't tend to maybe twinkle as much as some of the rest of the stars, you're possibly looking at Venus or one of the other planets instead of a star. It's very easy to make that mistake because what we're seeing when we look at Venus is reflected light from the sun. And having that object be so close to us makes it possibly more visible than stars that are producing their own light. So it's similar in size and mass to Earth, but the surface conditions are terrible, terrible, terrible. In fact, the hottest surface conditions on any planet in our solar system are not actually on the closest planet to the sun like you would expect. You would expect that to be on Mercury, being parked right next to the sun. The hottest surface conditions are actually on Venus, the second planet from the sun. Now, the reason why the conditions are so ridiculously hot and maintain that temperature throughout the day and night of 470 degrees Celsius, or getting close up to 900 degrees Fahrenheit, is because of a runaway greenhouse effect. The atmosphere of Venus is extremely thick, thicker than Mars by a long shot, and thicker than Earth's because of a very different composition of the planet's atmosphere. The planet's atmosphere is almost entirely carbon dioxide gas. And if it's carbon dioxide gas and it's as thick as Earth's atmosphere, then that means that you, you have an atmosphere that's almost entirely composed of greenhouse gases that are actually retaining heat. <laughs> 
So we'll look a little bit more into that in just a minute, but I wanted to just mention from the onset, conditions are ridiculously hot. Our information that we're able to obtain from Venus, both in terms of the geology of that planet and its climate, are very, very limited when you compare it to our ability to study Mars, for instance, or definitely our own planet. When you take pictures of the surface of Venus using another type of light, either maybe infrared or X-ray pictures, another wavelength beyond the visible light spectrum, you could see beyond the thick clouds that envelop the entire planet, you can actually see down to the planet's surface. So that's what you're looking at in this picture, is a picture of the planet as a whole as viewed from another type of light, essentially, another part of the electromagnetic spectrum other than the visible light spectrum that allows us to actually penetrate through the clouds and actually see the planet's surface. So what we can see is evidence of fracturing, evidence of volcanic activity, and either the planet is still capable of all of that geological activity or it's just only recently sort of shut down, but we don't see the impact cratering of billions of years of impacts like we do on um, uh, Mars, and especially not on, on uh, if you compare it to, to Mercury. So we think that this planet does have either an active or only recently deceased uh, geological cycle and plate tectonic cycle, but capable of producing volcanoes and fractures and what would be ocean basins if this planet it were at all capable of uh, keeping liquid water on the surface. It's not possible to have liquid water on the surface in these conditions because of course, at 470 degrees Celsius, 900 degrees Fahrenheit, you've far exceeded the boiling point of water. And any sort of liquid, especially water, on the surface of that planet would exist as a gas under those kind of temperatures. So the atmosphere is mainly carbon dioxide gas, maybe little bits of water vapor, maybe some ammonia, and all of these gases uh, do a substantial amount to actually retain heat uh, towards the surface of the planet. They act as greenhouse gases. The clouds and the little bit of precipitation that does actually occur on the planet are not made up of water, because again, even in the outer atmosphere, temperatures are way too high for that. The clouds and a little bit of precipitation that do occur on this planet are made up of sulfuric acid. So on Earth, we call that battery acid. Essentially, it rains battery acid on this planet. So you can see how much of, a, even from the perspective of sending a robotic mission, something like a rover probes into the planet's atmosphere and towards the planet's surface, or even from that perspective, a complete suicide mission. Uh, conditions are not even applicable for machinery to exist for long periods of time on the surface. We've been able to take some pictures from the surface of Venus for all of about 10 minutes before any sort of rover mission gets completely destroyed by the terrible surface conditions. So I wanted to stop and talk a little bit about this greenhouse effect and how incredibly different it is on Venus than on Earth. On Earth, we have a tiny, tiny little bit of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere, and we have some water vapor in our atmosphere, and some you know, nitrous oxide, and some other complicated molecules that retain a little bit of heat in towards the surface of the planet. So one of the ways that our planet and Venus gets heated is from incoming sunlight. On Earth, it's actually more capable of taking that heat and moving it towards the surface of the planet than conditions on Venus would allow. But just as our planet can take in heat from the sun, it can also give off heat from the sun. The surface of our planet gets heated up by this incoming heat and then allows for some of that heat to vacate the planet by um, taking that infrared radiation and moving it away from the planet. The small little bits of CO2 and other greenhouse gases in our planet's atmosphere basically just take some of that infrared heat that's moving away from the planet and uh, cause those wavelengths to just become sort of tied up and, and, and kind of reverberate through the structure of some of these molecules like CO2. And all that does is act like the roof of a greenhouse and it insulates the inner atmosphere of our planet. 
Now, if we compare that, the kind of setup where we have on Earth, to set the setup on Venus, while it's less possible because of the very, very reflective and thick cloud layers for some of that sunlight to get into the planet's atmosphere, conditions near the surface being so, so rich in those greenhouse gases, let's say 100% greenhouse gases as opposed to less than 2 or 3% greenhouse gases on our planet, the little bit of heat that does get uh, put into the planet's atmosphere is almost re completely retained by the inner atmosphere. So it only ever gets hotter and hotter and hotter and hotter on Venus. It has no potential for it to really cool off. So what might have happened, a possible story for the past on Venus, is that maybe it used to be a little bit more Earth-like. Maybe it was capable of some point, at some point of retaining some liquid on the surface. Maybe that was water, maybe that was some other compound. What would have happened over time, because of the rich, thick CO2 atmosphere, is that the planet's atmosphere would get warmer and warmer and warmer, and any sort of liquid on the surface of the planet would evaporate and become a gas. And having that liquid evaporate and become a gas only adds to the thickness of the atmosphere and the overall concentrations of greenhouse gas in the atmosphere. So then it warms up even more. That's a runaway greenhouse effect. That's what could potentially happen on our planet if we uh, allowed for a, an amazing unchecked amount of CO2 to be released into our planet's atmosphere. It's basically, you know, given at least our capacity um, in looking at our planet's atmosphere, um, it's basically impossible to do the same thing on Earth. There's just not enough CO2 to actually turn Earth into some kind of sort of Venus-like conditions. But we could probably get close and it would be bad. Now let's take all of these other planets that we've looked at and now compare them back to Earth. And Earth is going to look incredibly mild, incredibly welcoming and homey in comparison. Um, it's covered in more than two-thirds water. That's one of the things that makes it so very obviously different than any of these other terrestrial planets. It has a really nice stable range of temperatures that's very, very comfortable for life and allows for the evolution of life to uh, allow for all of these larger species like us and all of the other species, that uh, many of the other species that live on the continents too, have actually evolved over time. So the life and the water are essentially as much of what makes the difference between comparing Earth to all these other terrestrial planets as a size and mass. But as we'll see, all of these things are really sort of tied into each other. One thing that I wanted to talk about was where Earth's water actually came from, the origin of Earth's water. Because again, that's one of the things that makes our planet so incredibly different than some of the other terrestrial planets. Um, what allows Earth's water to form in the first place, uh, where our water probably came from in the first place, uh, were some of the very late stage impacts that happened to form our planet up. Now, all of the material that accreted to form the Earth itself, were, those objects were probably too dry, and they existed in a part of the early solar system where temperatures were too hot to allow for a lot of those materials to condense and then turn into solids. So there probably wasn't a whole lot of water as one of the original ingredients on Earth. But as temperatures declined and the solar system uh, began to be constructed and the planets all began to kind of form on their own, some of the late stage impacts probably included a type of meteorite called a carbonaceous chondrite. And these contain a pretty substantial amount of water, up to 8% water in these meteorites. So these late stage impacts probably brought water to Earth. And it's more likely that these were the source of Earth's water and not maybe late stage comet impacts or anything else for reasons that go back to um, some of the, the geochemistry and the difference between these meteorites and, and comets. Now, um, what allowed Earth to actually retain its water over time as being in the ideal place within our solar system for that water to actually be retained for long periods of time. This is the kind of area in other solar systems that we're looking for to find Earth-like planets, the so-called habitable zone, or you may have heard of it as the Goldilocks zone. 
Now, everybody knows the basic story behind Goldilocks. Goldilocks was looking for a bowl of porridge that was neither too hot or too cold, and it was just right. And that's essentially the same thing that we're looking for in the search for life in other solar systems, is a planet that's neither too hot or too cold, but just right. So in our solar system, that would not include a planet like Venus, too close to the sun and that runaway greenhouse effect creates conditions that are too hot on that planet to be very likely at least um, to harbor life conditions on Mars and some of the exterior uh, Jovian planets are too cold. All of the water on that planet would exist as a solid. Contrarily, all the water on the planet Venus would exist as gas. Right in the middle, it's possible for liquid water to exist in large quantities, that green zone in this picture, or the so-called habitable zone. And that's just where Earth exists very, very comfortably. So one of the biggest reasons why Earth is habitable, both for our form of life and most forms of life, is because we are large enough to retain this geological activity, and we're at the right distance away from the sun so that oceans could form. And the oceans on Earth were, of course, a really important part, uh, step in the evolution of life. Life originated in the oceans and evolved from the oceans. So in summary, when I look at all of these terrestrial planets, and the reason why we looked at them in the order that we did, the reason why we started with Mercury, and then we went to Mars, and then Venus, and then Earth, is because we were looking at them in increasing size and mass order. As we look at these planets and we speculate about their interior, we think that Mercury is the most likely to be completely geologically dead because it's the smallest and the least massive. Uh, compare this to maybe um, baking potatoes in an oven and how many of those potatoes would uh, be hot for a long period of time. If you had maybe one of those teeny tiny little red crawfish boiled potatoes, you put it out on the counter, even if it was hot, it would cool down a lot quicker than maybe one of those big gigantic russet baking potatoes. The larger planet in this analogy, the bigger the potato, is going to take a longer time to cool off. So even after four and a half billion years, because it's so hard to cool off a planet into space, Earth and probably Venus still retain some of this, this heat. Mercury is most likely geologically dead because of its size and mass and its inability to retain that heat. And that has an effect on the lack of atmosphere on a planet like that, and the lack then of any kind of capacity for erosion on the planet, any kind of evidence of geological activity on that planet. Then sort of in the medium category, we have Mars, still relatively uh, somewhat of an unknown. It certainly doesn't have an active magnetic field, which is why it doesn't have a thick atmosphere, probably why it doesn't have oceans. But whether or not that planet is still capable of any kind of geological activity is, is still a question. It's probably a no, but it's still a question. Then as we step up the ladder even more to look at the um, objects that are almost like twins for the terrestrial planets, Venus and Earth, we see that Venus probably still has an active geological uh, cycle and it certainly still has a thick atmosphere. And Earth still obviously, the most obvious of all of these planets, still has an active geological cycle and is capable of retaining liquid water and life. All right, so that is the terrestrial planets. That's our um, conversation on the terrestrial planets. In the next lecture, we're going to go on to talk about the Jovian planets. And as comfortable and familiar as all of the stuff when we're dealing with the terrestrial planets is, everything's going to become very abstract in the next lecture, but that should only make it more exciting. So until next time, keep looking up.